going to try and do what I couldn't do last week, and that is go through Revelation 5. Um, but before I really start looking at the text, let me say something about uh, the Bible itself as a whole. The Bible as a whole is one. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's 66 books, 40 different authors. It's been put on, uh, it was written in, on three different continents over a period of 1,500 years. And yet every single book in the Bible is completely connected to every other book in the Bible. That's how you know if the books are the Bible or not. The Holy Spirit did a miracle when he gave us the Bible. It's a, an incredible miracle. You don't have to check your brain in at the door to believe it. The Bible is a miracle from God. It's interesting to me that when God wanted to communicate with the human race, he didn't send a video, he didn't send a, a VCR, he didn't send a play troupe or a, a bunch of actors. He sent a book, the Bible. Every single book in the Bible is completely connected to every other book in the Bible. And there are some books in the Bible that have a stronger connection to other books of the Bible. And this is where we get into uh, more specifics. For example, Genesis and Revelation. If you really know what you're looking for, you can see that those two books are so connected. Every single problem raised in the book of Genesis finds its resolution in the book of Revelation. It's just beautiful, right? Everything that's there in Genesis shows up again in Revelation. What do, you, what do you got at the end? At the end, there's the tree of life. There's the river of life. There's the garden. There's man walking with God again in the cool of the day. It's just beautiful, isn't it? Everything that Genesis presents the problem, how we fell, and Revelation gives us the complete solution. And so does the rest of the Bible, but especially Genesis and Revelation. Now, we've been looking at Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. And I believe that those chapters in particular, which chapters are just man-made. There's no chapter breaks in the original. Man-selected chapters. I thank God for chapters, though. It makes it easier to find stuff. All right. Um, you, you wouldn't be able to put those tabs in scrolls. Okay. Um, look. Genesis, or Revelation 4 and 5 have a very strong connection to Genesis 4, okay, which is the story of Cain and Abel. Did you ever think about that? Well, you know, of all the things you could put in Genesis, which that's the original book, God ordained that book. It's everything basic to humanity, and yet there's so little there. You could read the book of Genesis in one, one hour, a couple hours maybe. First 11 chapters, everything basic to all humanity. If I was going to write a book, everything I thought was basic to all humanity, it'd probably be in about 20,000 or 30,000 pages, okay? But God didn't. He just handpicked exactly what he thought was so basic, so, so universal, so applying to all people of all time. And, and, and Genesis 1 through 11 is like 50 pages. He put it in there. He had to, how, where we came from, who we are. Why we're here. What a family is, what a man is, what a woman is. Who knew that we'd even have to be reminded of that? This perverted generation. He has to define it. And he gave it to us. And what happened in history, the big cataclysm, the flood, and why the flood came, that's very important. And he wanted us to know why... Uh, what happened after the flood when all nations of the world defected away from him in the Tower of Babel? That's what he thought was very, very essential. By the way, we're living all that stuff again today, okay? It's all happening again. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end. Then you got the story of um, Cain and Abel. Why did he put that there? The first murder, but he's not interested in that part. There would be 
millions of murders, and he knew it. As soon as men fell away from God, there would be rivers of human blood shed by other human beings. It was going to be cold. It was going to be nasty. It was going to be just what we saw in London the other day, what we're seeing all over the world. And what you can't see in the abortion clinics everywhere, the spirit of murder. That's not why he put the story of Cain and Abel in there primarily. There'd be a lot of murders. It's the issue that underlines that story. Because if you remember the story of Cain and Abel, there's two brothers, fratricide. And it's a story of murder around a very important subject, worship. Did we not just worship the Lord? Who would think that murder would be connected with worship? But yes, the two brothers worshiped. Abel was not an atheist. He was a theist. He believed in God. Cain was not an atheist. He was a theist. He believed in God. Both of them worshipped the Lord. But here's what happened. The Lord rejected Cain's sacrifice and accepted Abel's. Remember that? The Lord rejected one and accepted the other. Well, what did Cain sacrifice? Cain sacrificed the best of the fruit of his ground. And what did Abel sacrifice? The best of his flock. Now listen, all worship is a statement to God. Did you not just worship? Do we not worship? That's not a trick question. Of course we worship, right? I'm not trying to trick you. I never do that up here. What are you saying? Worthy is the Lord. I adore you. You should. When Cain brought bushels of fruit from the ground that the Lord blessed, he is saying, the Lord is my creator. And I acknowledge that the Creator blessed the fruit of this ground. And I want to acknowledge that. That sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds good. But the Lord rejected it. Abel comes with something streaming blood between his fingers. A slaughtered animal. The best of his flock. He's making a statement too. If Cain is saying, look, the Lord is my creator, and I acknowledge that he blessed the ground that I worked in, and the Lord is the one that blessed that ground, and I want to honor my creator. But he was rejected. Well, it is true the Lord is your creator, and it is true that anything you have at all in this life is a gift of your creators, whether you're a Christian or not. You owe the Lord a duty of worship. But it's not enough anymore to worship the Lord just as creator. Why? Because something happened after creation. We sinned. Anybody here? See, what Abel's saying by his offering that he brought to God, which I believe every offering that we bring to God Verbally, orally, physically, our money, whatever. All is a statement. All. He's saying, with blood streaming down his fingers and tears streaming down his eyes, I acknowledge that I have sinned and I deserve to die. But please, dear God, accept this substitute that you appointed in my place. And the fire came from heaven and consumed his sacrifice. And no fire fell from heaven and consumed Cain's sacrifice. Although God spoke to him. Okay. God spoke to him and said, look, if you do the right thing, well, what would be the right thing? Well, what would be the right thing would be to draw near to God through a, a, a life, a sacrifice of life 
through a substitute. That's the only way you can be accepted by God, is if you draw near to God through a bloody substitute. The modern sensibility says, man, that's gross. Oh, the, how inhumane. Oh, I can't believe it. Did you know that the author of the uh, heretical and evil book, The Shack, who were many Christians, 1,000 Christian leaders said, this is a great book. You've got to get into this movie. You've got to go see the shack. I've learned so much about God. 1,000 Christian leaders possibly blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because the shack is a complete denial of everything God says about himself, the Holy Spirit. The author of the book says, I do not believe that, it would be, that God sent his son to die for our sins. That would be child abuse. Now Listen. This isn't new. He put it in Genesis. It's as old as Genesis. Cain is higher, higher religion than bloody religion. More humane, much more humane. No need for bloodshed. Just acknowledge that God is creator. Much higher, much more elevated religion. Only problem is God rejects it. Abel's got tears running down his face as he worships God, which is no better place to cry than in church. Amen? And blood running down his fingers. And he says, God, please, I deserve to die. Accept this substitute that you ordained. See, where did he learn that? Well, God taught his parents that, and they taught the boys that. But the one boy was higher than the real re revealed religion. Much more humane, just like Mao. Now, same kind of spirit. Now, you know how the story goes, right? Cain would not kill a beast. Perhaps a lamb or a calf. He would not kill a beast. He ended up killing his brother. You understand the, the meaning of this story? Do you understand what this story is really teaching spiritually about all of humanity? That if you won't come through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, somehow or other, you're going to make someone else pay for your sins. I remember I witnessed to a Muslim on a plane, and I told him that Jesus died for our sins, and he said, we Muslims need no sacrifice. And I risked a riot on the plane, but I had to say it. It popped out of my mouth. Then why do you shed blood everywhere on earth? Which, by the way, that shedding of blood that they do, that's religious. That's sacrificial. This is an amazing uh, passage in the, in the New Testament um, where John is talking about Christian love. And I thought this was amazing the first time I read it because he said, you should love one another. That's what his commandment is. You should love one another, not like Cain. Well, that's a no-brainer, right? Of course not like Cain. What do you mean? Well, wait a minute, though. What he's saying is Cain did have a kind of a love, a humanistic love. We don't shed no blood around here. We don't go for the bloody religion. We don't call people sinners. We don't consider that. We come, we are more elevated. He says, not like Cain, who he says, was of the devil. And he said, and why did he slay his brother? This is a great question, New Testament. Why did he slay his brother? Well, first of all, before we answer the question, if you look at the word slay in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it's not a word for murder. It's a ritual word for sacrifice. See? He wouldn't come by the human sacrifice the Lord ordained that sinners come by. Therefore, he ended up sacrificing his brother, not to God, but to his own wounded pride. See? Ah, uh, America rejected Christianity about 40 years ago. 
Not all of America. There's still more Christians here than I've ever seen anywhere else in the world. But official America, educated and elite America, said no to Christianity. It's base to tell someone they're a sinner. It's base to put down someone like that. It's base to say that someone had to die for you. You know what they did shortly after that? They legalized abortion. And we got 50 million murders of innocent children. The blood is on this national's hands. Jude could predicted it. Woe to them, he said. They've gone the way of Cain. They've gone after the way of Cain. What is the theology of the first murderer? Because he had one. He was a worshiper. God as creator, but never God as redeemer. See, one of the beautiful things that I've tried to emphasize about Revelation, and I hope you get, is it does this like no other book in the whole Bible. What other book is going to take you right into heaven? Into the very throne room of God. But Revelation does. Revelation 4 and 5, you go into the throne room. And we already talked about Revelation 4, but you go in so deep. You go past the throne. You go past 24 elders. You go past the cherubim that were in the garden that kept the sinners out of, away from the presence of God. You go deeper into the, uh, into the throne room. And then at the climax of Revelation 4, you get to this point where all creation is singing the same song. And by the way, it's the song we always sing ourselves because, well, we got it out of the Bible. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you created everything. And for thy pleasure, they were created. This is the original song. And he sees a vision. One day all creation <laughs> singing this song to him who made everything. You ever wonder why we have a creation battle in America? One of our big cultural battles is a creation battle in the schools. Why? Because once you admit that you were created, then you're not your own person to do with whatever you want with your own life. You actually are accountable to the one that made you. We can't have that. Amen? But that's the old song. Now, it's all still worth singing. But it doesn't stop there, see? It can't stop there. Like Cain found out, you won't be accepted by God if all you do is acknowledge that he's your creator. It's a start. By the way, this is the way back for many people of this evil generation. The way back. Where did you go wrong? Well, humanly speaking... You went to school eight hours a day, five days a week, and got steeped in evolution. And you went to Sunday school or church somewhere about an hour a week. And a lot of people just chuck creation. Well, a lot of churches do. <laughs> They're going to answer to God for that. But a lot of people just shrug it off. They never make a decision to become an atheist. You don't have to. They just flow into it. Okay. And there's something happens subconsciously once you shrug, shrug off the creator. That's why some people are actually happy about Darwin. They're happy. You know, Darwin's on the 10-pound note in Great Britain. They love Darwin. Why? He liberated us. From what? From God. <laughs> We actually used to be a moral society and think that we had to do the proper and the right thing. But Darwin set us free. And he did set him free. How many know not all freedom is good? This base man's floating in space. And he feels so free. No limits anywhere except one. Wait a minute, one limit? Yeah, you're still tethered to that spaceship with this hose. Well, I want to know what total freedom feels like. So he pulls out his space scissors and clip. 
I'm free! <laughs> free of what? Air? You want to be free of air? A way back? Home? Love? How about the experiment of sexual freedom? We're free of the patriarchy. We're free of commitment. We're free of marriage. Really, that means you're free of stability, commitment, faithfulness, security. Some freedom, huh? You know what's interesting? We live 50 years into the experiment. Don't you love this wonderful world that we've made for ourselves? I'd take Ozzie and Harriet again. <laughs> I'd go back. But you can't go back. It's like we can't go back to Eden. So you may as well give up on that. You can only go to heaven or hell. Can't go back to Eden. Oh, yeah, we've got ourselves free. Well, what's the way back? The way back for many, 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 many thousands of people. That's why I thank the Lord for what they did in Kentucky, building Noah's Ark. They want to draw people's attention back to Genesis. The way back is to go back and say, you know what? I am a human being made in the image of God. From that point on, whenever that heartfelt conviction comes, sanity will come back to this crazy generation. If it ever does. Because then you can be properly oriented. Like I said, it's not enough, though, to acknowledge God as creator. Because what happened? Well, after creation, we sinned. That's why the Bible says in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Centuries later, God ordains a book of the Bible and says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. What? Do we got to have two beginnings? Yes, you have to have two beginnings. Or another way of putting it, you must be born again. Why? What happened between the first beginning and the second beginning? I was trying to share the gospel with a really nice guy. He's a Catholic guy. I said, haven't you ever heard that Jesus said you must be born again? He said, why should I be born again when I got it right the first time? Okay. You didn't. We broke God's law. Anybody here? And think things are messed up. This is a... I'm in danger of rambling here. I better stick with my notes. This, this, is, this is what's going on now. Is there's, humanity is divided into two, two divisions. There's a lot of people coming to the conviction, man, are things ever messed up? This world is so screwed, so confused, so backwards. A lot of other people think, man, this is the greatest time of liberation the world's ever seen. Man, we are so free now. You could be gay. You could be transgender. You can decide what you want to be. Some people think this is great. Some people think this is awful. And therein lies the difference between being deluded unto damnation or the possibility of being saved. Like if you, if you grieve over it. If you know, you just know something in right. Something is so not right. And the Bible tells us the answer. Well, what, 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 why can't we just, just end right here? God, you made me. Because when we fell, we've created such a mess that we can't even solve it. You understand? We can't. And this, therefore, in Revelation 5, what he does, which I'll take you into this chapter now, he takes us deeper into the throne room. Deeper. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Remember, he saw a throne and he saw a being on the throne that was absolutely indescribable. And the being on the throne has in his right hand a book. And it's a scroll, and it's got seven seals, and you can see that it's written on both sides. In other words, whatever it is, it's a complete plan. It's his plan to finally undo the damage, to redeem all of creation. See, in the, by the time God's done, it won't just be me and you that'll be born again, it'll be the whole universe. He said, behold, I make all things new. 
You know when it says, if any man be in Christ, we read, he is a new creation. That's not what it literally reads. Behold, a new creation. He's going to make everything all over again, and you're either part of that or not through the new birth. Oh, I pray to God that everyone under the sound of my voice will be born again. Please, God, show us the need. He sits on the throne. He has the answer. But here's the problem. In God's economy, the mess came about by a man, not by God. So the way God looks at it, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15, by man came death. Therefore, by man must come the resurrection of the dead. Man made this mess. It requires a man to solve it. <laughs> Wait a minute. See, for centuries, God's people, in the millions, probably every minute of every hour of every day somewhere on the earth, someone is praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. You ever think about what they're praying? Come on, please, undo this mess. Set everything right. Destroy evil. Destroy sin. Destroy wickedness. Reverse the curse. Redeem man. Redeem the earth. Oh God, let thy kingdom come. This has been going on for centuries. Just that line alone. Oh, not to mention the other thousands of heartfelt prayers are saying the same thing for centuries. Every minute, every hour, every day, some redeemed person or the Jews before Jesus, let thy kingdom come. You think he's going to let that drop to the ground and he's going to ignore that? But what's the problem? Why hadn't it come? Well, one of the problems is if a man made the MS, got to find a man qualified to undo the mess. Now, let this hit you. A lot of you have been saved long enough. You know there's none righteous, right? But, you know, sometimes it just really hits you. My good Lord. Who is going to... Who's qualified? Who could do this? And this is what you get in Revelation 5, verse 2. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Oh, the book's written. There's a plan. Let thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let the curse be reversed. Let evil be finally defeated. Let the violence and sin and hatred and lust of this world finally be reversed. Let the kingdom that he promised come into being. I don't know about you, but I live for that day. Do you know he promised us a kingdom? And every single person that's born again has a place in that kingdom. Oh, one day soon, dear friends, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. It's called the reign of the Son of Man. But who could do this? Verse uh, 3, and no man in heaven or in earth, that's past, present, future. Anybody qualified? No man in heaven or earth, neither under the earth. No one's ever lived that is alive that will live is worthy to open this book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look therein. You can't even so much look at it. Now we're looking at it right now. We're looking at the book. That was in the hand of the one that sat on the throne. What happened? He says, I wept much. Man, did it hit me. It's hit me many times too. What would we do without Jesus? My gosh. We'd be so lost. So damned. So stuck. There's this part in the, in the garden story in Genesis 3 where the man and the woman have sinned. They've gone from one state of being into another state of being. Then God says, hurry, get them out of here. Why? 
Well, if they go back and eat of the tree of life in this state, then they'd be damned forever and there'd be no salvation. So he drove them out of the garden. Who can undo this? But I uh, often think, who can, who can take away the stain of my life? Who? When I was Catholic, we had a system. Penances and confessions and works. Little tiny mini fasts. Holy days of obligation. What are we trying to do? Undo it. Just get it off me. Get it off. So, uh, he says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look therein. Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals. Hey, we found someone. We found a human being qualified to undo what the first man did. The first man, Adam, disobeyed God. And everybody in the world was plunged into condemnation. Cheer up, we found someone. If the first man, Adam, could do one act of disobedience and plunge the whole human race into ruin, then the last Adam can perform one good act and save the whole human race and restore us to right standing with God. He's called the Lion of Judah. See, the Old Testament uh, informs the new. Uh, Jacob, the patriarch, had a vision for each of his 12 sons. And we're going to get into this on Wednesday. And what each one, he gave prophecy. He says, gather around, let me tell you what will happen in the last days. And he just went through the sons, told their whole future. When he came to his son, Judah... Oh, by the way, if you read his life story, he's not a very good person. He's a very bad person, really, but he did find God. He said, Judah, the lion's going to come through your line. He's going to undo everything that the evil has done. The lion's going to come through. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he'll prevail. He'll win the victory for the human race. I'm paraphrasing. He says, you'll know when he comes. It'll be when your tribe loses the power of life and death. That's when he'll come. Now you fast, fast forward centuries, the, the Jews are trying to condemn Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate. He says, you put him to death. They said, we can't. Oh, why? Well, the Romans took away from the Jews the power of life and death in 7 AD. A lot of the Jews thought, what? The prophecy is, it, it hasn't been fulfilled. The power of the, the scepter has been removed from our tribe. And the Messiah's not here. They didn't know. He was a seven-year-old carpenter's apprentice in Sproutsville, otherwise known as Nazareth. When he comes, he'll be a lion. He'll reverse the judgment. He'll gain the victory. He will get the victory for us. He's, this is a scene in heaven. Hey, we found someone, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. God made King David a promise. This is important too. You mind if I go on a sidetrack? King David says, I've got a house to live in. Why doesn't God have a house to live in? And so he took his earnings from his years as a warrior and a king, equivalent of $20 million, He said, I, I want to build God a house. And prophet Nathan says, go for it. And then that night God said to Nathan, go back and tell him, no, don't. You aren't going to build me a house. But he said, but I'll build you a house. I'll build you a house. One of your sons is going to sit on the throne forever and ever. Now it looked bad because David's sons, they went from being good kings to bad kings to rotten kings, so rotten that it's almost like the whole tree is just cut off. And Israel thought, well, there's another promise not going to be fulfilled. But Isaiah said, I saw a shoot sprig out of the stump of Jesse. I saw a branch come out of David. 
And to him will be given the government of the whole world. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. The son of David is the Messiah. He hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. He's qualified because he's sinless. He did no evil. Nor was any guile ever in his mouth. He never took anything from anyone. He gave everything. He didn't take anyone's life. He gave his life. We sing a song. He gave his life. What more could he give? (laughs) He gave his life for God, too, as an offering to God for our sins. Well, he turns. Where is this lion? I got to see this lion. It must be a mighty lion. And he says, And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, verse 6, there stood a lamb. You go to look for a lion and you see a lamb? That's the lion. What a mystery. What a mystery. Centuries earlier, Samson had a riddle. He told her the wedding. It turned out to be a prophecy. On the way to the wedding, he said... He passed by a, uh, a dead lion, and the bees had made a comb in it, its carcass. And he just reached in and ate the, ate the honey. He'd be a man of the flesh, you know, good appetites. He gets to the, bee, the party, and he says, uh, they, they're, they're playing party games. He's got 30 guests, they're all Philistines. He says, you guys each give me a suit of clothes, if you can't, if you can, uh, if I, if you, if I can give you a riddle, you won't give me the answer. And if I, and if you do give me the answer, then I owe you thirty se- seats of clothes, suits of clothes. Back in those days, suit of clothes was very expensive. Most people only had two. So they, he says, "What's the riddle?" Well, out of the strong came something sweet. Out of the eater came something to eat. Would you ever get that in a million years? Would you ever get that in a million years? How are you ever going to get that? Samson had a bride that was a Philistine. This is a wedding party. The bride says, come on, tell me, tell me, tell me. Something told him not to tell her, but she kept on wearing him down. He told her, what's stronger than a lion? What's sweeter than honey? So her Philistine friend said, you tell us what the secret is, or we're going to burn your house down with you and your father in it. And she had a choice, didn't she? To believe Samson, who said he'd protect her, or to believe the Philistines, who threatened to burn her. Everyone's got a choice. Who are you going to believe? She actually believed the Philistines. And betrayed the secret. And you know how the story ends? They burn her house down. If you believe the devil, you will surely be burned forever. You will be damned. So here's the, here's the answer to the riddle. What's stronger than a lion? And what's sweeter than honey? Well, only problem is, and Samson had to get this clothes. Kind of funny how he got them. I can remember the movie of Victor Mature, you know. You see him jump in the bushes with a bunch of Philistines, and you see these clothes kind of flying out. (laughs) But the answer itself is a riddle. You ever think about that? What's stronger than a lion? What's sweeter than honey? You know what's stronger than a lion? A lion will go out there and just take you out. But remember, this lion is dead. You know what's stronger than a lion? Sacrificial death. Sacrificial death. You know the power it took for Jesus to stay on the cross? He could have just said one word and wiped everybody out. He stayed right there. You know what's sweeter than honey? Well, the word of God is sweeter than honey. So is eternal life. There's nothing sweeter than eternal life. I'm so glad I got eternal life. How about you? By the way, I feel led to tell someone, you know, if you're not, if you're not sure about it. Someone says, well, well, maybe I'll get eternal life when I die. If you wait till you die, it's too late. 
The gift of God is right now, it's eternal life. It's, oh, eternal life, that means you're going to live forever? No, that's not really what it means. Everyone's going to live forever. Some people are going to live forever in hell. Some people are going to live forever in heaven. So there's no question that everyone will live forever. Why? Because you aren't a dog. You were made in the image of God. Well, then what is eternal life? What's well, the quality of life? We go and be, we, God gives us a new life that makes us, takes us from being self-centered to being God-centered. I used to love myself above all, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Above everyone, above my neighbor, everything was self. But then when I found out that Jesus died for me, the truth of it hit me so hard that I could never see myself the same way. He made me love God. I got a question, body. You answer it in your own soul. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you love him? Book of Ephesians. Cursed is everyone that does not love our Lord Jesus. You can't be passive about him. You know, what he did is so powerful, you can't be passive about him. Somebody pays a fine you owe that $30 million, and you go, oh, thanks, that's great. Okay, great. What's for, dun- what's for dinner? What? <laughs> well, he gave his life. You either love him or you hate him. Well, uh, <clears throat> so he looks to see the lion, he sees a lamb. And what it says in verse 6, what he sees at, in the lamb is lamb as it had been slain. What it literally says is with the marks of slaughter. A lamb with the marks of slaughter. You know the only man-made thing in heaven is the scars of Jesus? He saw the marks. And having seven horns, that means he's got all power. And seven eyes, he's got all wisdom. And he has the sevenfold spirit of God sent forth into all the earth. Book of Isaiah teaches about that. Hold your finger in Revelation. Look at Isaiah 11. There's people that live their whole life and die and never take a glimpse into the throne room of God. Never take them there. Nobody took them there. Wow. Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a rod. This is the prophecy I was referring to earlier. Of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Here's the sevenfold. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. And reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips Shall he slay the wicked? Oh, Jesus, let it be. Let it be. The violent and the wicked. Go back to the book of Revelation. Let me try to move this on. You got this scene. The lamb goes and takes the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And you're supposed to be so exultant. Yes! Bring this stuff to pass. Please, open these seals. Get this book going. Please, O oh Lord. That's how we're supposed to be. I always pray that Jesus would come back. You're supposed to. I always pray that Jesus would come back. You know, everyone that ever prayed, let thy kingdom come. They're praying that Jesus would come back. That's what the parable of the widow woman is about. You can't find anyone more helpless in the ancient world than a widow woman. Jesus said, men ought to always pray and not faint. Not supposed to cave in. Not supposed to just say, all right, this is the new normal. I think this is amazing, you know, the new normal. Terrorism is the new normal. That's what Theresa May and Angela Merkel said. You're supposed to just accept it. The mayor of London, who's a Muslim himself, well, Islamic terrorism is just part and parcel of living in a big city. 
It's like subways and stuff, right? But what other new normals have we accepted? How many would have, of us would have been appalled at gay marriage? We'd never even heard of it before. But I guess it's the new normal. You're always giving in to the new normal. But there are some people that will never, ever, ever accept any of it. Then what do they do? They cry out. Oh, God, vindicate the world. Come back quickly. Establish your kingdom in righteousness. We just can't take it. We just can't accept it. Don't want it. And never will make peace with it. I'm asking Jesus to come back. Pray and don't faint. When he'd taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fall down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. So the elders have these, these, these censers. You ever see a censer? If you ever go to an Orthodox church or a Catholic church, they have a censer. It's a chain with a ball of incense burning. They gather all the prayers down through time of all God's people. Not one of them disregarded. Not one. See, in this earth, they say, oh, prayer is a waste of time. Come on. I actually heard people say after one of these terror incidents, quit praying about it. The atheists were saying, it's, it's pathetic. Quit, quit saying you're going to pray about it. God gathers his prayers up. Not one of them's lost. The saints aren't powerless. They're just powerful in a different way. He gathers all the saints. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy kingdom come. Vindicate the poor and the needy. By the way, the poor and the needy in the Bible, they're not financially poor. They're the poor of heart. They're the people that know they don't fit here anymore. They don't belong here. It says, I better move along here. They sung a new song. Oh, yeah, the, this whole thing is centered around these two songs. The old song is creation. The new song is redemption. The new song is redemption. You know how it says, oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. He has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arms again. The new song is a specific song. It's centered around the blood. Jesus. We go all the way back to Genesis 4. And behold, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Oh, I want to be there. Saying with a loud voice, here's the new song. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You know, I could weep for a thousand Christian leaders who, for whatever reason, want to be relevant, would endorse a movie and a book by a man who says Jesus didn't die for us. That'd be child abuse. How could a father require a son to die as a substitute? This takes you right to heaven. They don't think that way. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He has redeemed us. You know what redeemed means? Purchased us and restored us back to our right use. You think you were created to be lustful? You think you were made to live in a stupor? Got a lot of potheads these days. You think God made you to live in a stupor that everyone else has to take care of? You're losing it. You're losing the reason you were made. You are selling it out the river. You were not created to just buzz all the time. God has something higher, but you must be redeemed. Anybody? God, our culture is just surrendering everything Judeo-Christian. Worthy is the lamb that was slain 
to receive power and riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and glory and honor and power be unto him that sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. He purchased us by his blood. This is what struck me coming into the church world. Are you washed in the blood? About five songs about the blood in the first assembly of God, each service, and I thought, man, this is bloody. What is this? But then I came to understand, in closing, the meaning of the new song. This is what it took, and nothing less. You understand what it took? You know how heinous sin is? You know what it took to remove the stain? The best person that ever lived offers himself as a sacrifice in our place? Oh, God, you are awesome, right? Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, everybody. God bless you.